Welcome to part three of our pathfinding series. Uh, in this video, we're going to build on the breadth first search algorithm we explored in the last video and talk about how we can find the shortest path between any two points on the map. In our previous video, we used the breadth first search algorithm to explore the whole map and find the path from any point on the map to some goal location. And we also made it so that we can move that goal location around and see how the paths change. Right, and that's useful for a number of different types of applications. But sometimes you want to find the path from one just from one point to another point. You have the concept of some start location and some end location. You just want to find that path. You don't care about the rest of the map. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna call that home location the goal and we're going to add a start location okay and then I've actually loaded some other graphics to do this so what we want to do is be able to have a start location and a goal location right and I'm using the middle mouse button to change my start and the right mouse button to change my goal and I just want to draw this path not any of the other paths so let's start by changing what we're drawing down here on the bottom. This loop right here is drawing all the arrows in every place on the map. So instead, we're going to get rid of this. And what we're going to do is just uh, draw the path from the start to the goal. Okay, And so we want to start with, we're just going to move from node to node along that path. And we're going to start with the start node, uh, the one right after it. Because I don't want to draw an arrow on top of the X. I just want to draw the next one. So I'm going to start with the next one, whichever one is pointing, whichever one the start points to, right? So as long as we haven't reached home, as long as we haven't reached home, we're going to keep doing this. We're just going current. We're just going to keep drawing one after another until we've drawn them all. So uh, we're going to take the current.x times the tile size plus tile size over 2 again so that we can get the center. Right, do the same thing for uh, the y. And then we're going to pick the arrow we want. Which is whichever item in the path we are looking at. It's going to give us that direction vector so we can pick the right arrow. Get rect so that we can center it and with that on the screen. Now, we also want to find, after we've lit that, we want to find the next node in the path. So we just add the current, we just add the next one, the next vector in the path. So like that. Okay. Okay. And, oh, I have an error message. Oh, right. We're going to the called it goal not home okay so now we can just draw our single path from the start to home okay now this works fine and it's gonna draw it from anywhere on the screen but you might notice something a little bit odd if I remove some of these walls you can see that we're not really taking the shortest path right we're going all the way down and then all the way over when it would be shorter if we you know, took some steps over, right? If we were right way over here, see it just draws straight. And that's happening because we are doing, because of the way we're doing our find neighbors. So here in our find neighbors, for each node, we're adding the various connections, which we listed here. And we listed them in this order, right? We're, we're trying to the right, to the left, down and then up. And that just happens to be the order we wrote it in. 
but that means it's always going to prefer going right over going left. And it's going to always prefer going down over going up. And that's what's getting us those really uh, long straight stretches. And there's a few different ways you can deal with this, but the most the simplest and the most elegant is when you get the neighbors for your node, we're going to add just a little bit of variation here by just saying if I'm going to take, I'm just going to add the node X and Y. Okay. And we're just going to alternate here using percent two to say if it's an even number, we're going to do one thing. If it's an odd number, we're not. If it's an even number, I'm just going to take neighbors and I'm going to reverse it. Okay. So every other time we're going to go the opposite direction through this and look at these neighbors first before we look at these. And that's going to let it choose different directions. See, So now if I remove some of these walls here again, you can see we're taking a much more straight path, right? We come down and then we start jogging over. So if we were actually exactly diagonal, we'll take the most diagonal path. And that's going to work when we are, when we are um, really far apart as well, right? It's going to find the diagonal path and that's going to look a lot better as we travel around since things like this when we go around corners. Okay, so that looks good and we're getting good paths now from start to end. Now our problem is that this is very inefficient, right? Because wherever we are on the map, we're exploring the whole map and finding all these paths, even though this is the one we want. So I'm only showing this one. Remember our flood fill algorithm, our breadth first search is searching the whole map. So the, so we're searching all of these tiles over here, even though there's no way for them that they would be part of the path. Right. And so that's where we can start talking about some variations to this process to improve its efficiency. And we only want to find this, so let's not waste our time doing other parts of the map. Okay, so the way we could solve this is we could go to our search here and we're going to add that there's a start tile and an end tile. And all we need to do is here in our loop as we're going through and looking at every tile, if current equals end, break, right? Because if, if we found the final tile, I mean, we found the goal tile, we don't need to keep searching. So we can just stop searching and return what path we have. So let's change that. We just need to add that we included this in the function. Now, if we run this, this isn't going to look any different, right? It's still going to find the path we want, right? But let's look at what's happening by looking at that animation that we had before. Okay, so here's my animated breadth first search. And so when I start this off, we're going to keep filling out like normal. But as soon as we reach and have found the start tile, we can stop and we don't need to bother exploring any of these over here. Okay, let's look at it one more time uh, with some walls in there so that we can see how well it works in that case, right? So here we are, we know what the path is going to be. Let's see how quickly it finds it, right? So now we saved ourselves a whole bunch of time by not exploring around all of these areas. Okay, so it's much, much more efficient. So back over to our code, remember our breadth first search is storing the full path, right? It's, or it's storing all of the tiles that it visits. So we can just show these on the screen by this little section I added here, which just goes through that path and fills them in in a darker color so that we can see how much of our map we're actually exploring whenever we run. So as I move around, we can see, right, when it's close by, we're not very far away, we're saving a whole lot of time. And you can imagine on a much bigger map or a much more complicated map that this would save 
a whole lot of time, especially if you're having to recalculate these paths uh, often because you know the player is moving around, the mobs are moving around, uh, whatever the case may be. Walls might be changing and changing the path. So the last thing we want to look at here is what if we allow diagonal movement on our grid? Right, right now we can only choose neighbors for any tile that are in the four directions, up, down, left, and right. But what if we want to change that? Well, we just need to add to the list of connections here the four diagonal directions. Right, so you can go that way, that way, you could go that way, or you could go that way. Right? And now when we do find neighbors, we're going to get any of the eight directions possible. And our search will work just fine. This is just going to go through and all those tiles get added to the frontier. That's all it cares about. Uh, but we do need to change right here uh, so that we can see our path and have some diagonal images. I'm going to add uh, those as well. one, negative one, and there. Okay, now when we run this, we're going to see that we can take diagonal paths now. But you might notice something odd about these diagonal paths. If I remove some of these walls, uh, you can see it really easily. Get rid of those. And let's say we had a straight line, right? Why isn't it taking this path? Right? This path should be shorter than this path. Although if you count it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 steps, it's the same this way. Actually, let's do it a little bit closer so you can, so you can see. Right? 1, 2, 3, 4 steps. 1, 2, 3, 4 steps. Right? So our search algorithm is seeing this is the same distance as this. Right? And that's because diagonal paths aren't the same distance as horizontal and vertical paths, but, it, but by our search algorithm, they are. Um, it costs the same amount to step one step this way as it does to step one in this direction. And in reality, if this distance were one, then this distance would be the square root of two, which is about 1.4. And so to fix this, we're going to need to talk about having the concept of a movement cost, right? Like you could imagine that not only are diagonal moves a little bit more expensive than horizontal or vertical moves, but you could have different types of terrain too, right? Moving through the um, forest area is slower than moving through the grass. So maybe this path, a path around the forest is, is faster than moving through it. And all those kind of things can be implemented in a different version of the algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm. And we're going to do that in the next video. But in the meantime, if you want to have some nice straight paths under this scheme, all we need to do really is go back over here and remove, I'll just comment it out, our little uh, reversal of the, of the list every other time, right? Because the idea of that one is that helps it find the shortest Path. And that works great when you're only going horizontal, horizontally and vertically, but now um, this isn't helping us. So if we comment that out, you'll see we get much more, much straighter paths, right, even when things are in a straight line. All right, so this will be a good enough solution for now. Um, but as you can see, of course, just getting from here to here, we're still exploring all of this part of the map all the way around, and it's not super efficient yet. So in the next video, we'll talk about Dijkstra's algorithm and implementing the movement costs and some other strategies for uh, improving the efficiency of the search so we don't spend so much time on unimportant uh, parts of the map. All right, so that'll do it for this video. I will see you in the next part. Thanks.